Okay, good luck. We just uh, blessed the month of Nis Nisan today, which the word Nisan means miracles and wonders. And so it's appropriate to uh, share miracles and wonders in general every month of Shabbos, certainly on the, after we bless the month of Nisan, and um, it's especially appropriate. So I'm going to share with you uh, two, hopefully three stories tonight. Uh, let's get started. The great Sadik of Rizim, the soul of Rizim, was once visited by a great Chassid al Rebbe, whose name was Rav Isaac Humler. Rav Isaac Humler, um, when he he came to the to the soul of Rizim, there were two people waiting to see him. One was a great Torah scholar. And the other was a more simple guy who had written, uh, he written a book about stories of tzaddik. And the Rishon Rebbe, he said he wants to speak to the author of the storybook, and only after he spoke to him and he wrote in approbation for his book, did he speak to the second guy, the guy who had written great Torah insights, a great a. a a scholar of great renown. And then he wrote an a approbation for that guy. And Rabbi Isaac Humler was wondering why the original Rebbe, he delayed speaking to this great Torah giant and instead preferred to speak first to this less, um, less scholarly individual who had written a book about the stories. So he didn't ask this to the original Rebbe, but after a few days, uh, there was a, a celebration in Rizim because of Rosh Chodesh. They had a special meal. And then, as it says in the Code of Jewish Law, you're supposed to have a special increase in eating in honor of Rosh Chodesh. So he, uh, at this, at this, at this uh, Rosh Chodesh Tish, at this celebration, he um, was called out by the Rizim Rebbe with divine inspiration that we saw Rizim knew what was bothering him. And he said to him, he said like this, he said, the Litvish Agoin, the Lithuanian genius, Isaac Humler, was from, his last name was Epstein, and he was originally, before he came, became a chasr of the Alt Rebbe, was of the Lithuanian persuasion. And he, the, the original Rebbe said, it was sort of like a, like a shtech, sort of like a, a uh, criticism. He uh, wonders about us. He wonders about us. How come I showed preference to the one who writes about stories before I uh, pay attention to the one who who uh, wrote in, in scholarly works in Torah. He wonders why, why I gave him more attention. So he said, the, I follow the order that the Rashi tells us in the very first Rashi on the Torah. Rashi asks the same question that the Litvish are going, that this Lithuanian genius has. What was the question that Rashi has in the first Rashi? Rashi asks, how come the Torah begins with the stories of Tzaddikim? The Torah begins with the stories of Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov, and only then did the Torah begin talking about uh, the mitzvah, the first mitzvah of Chodesh Hashem, which is which we read today. How come the Torah um, delays? Uh, it starts about the stories of Tzaddikim. Why doesn't it start with a mitzvah? So why is it? So Rashi says, Hashem wants to share with us the power of His works. Hashem wants to share with us the power and the, the, the uh, greatness of Hashem. In order for us to instill in ourselves the, the absolute truth, the Baal Shem Tov taught, that Hashem creates the world every second, the way to get to that truth is by saying stories of Tzadikim. So it's true that when you say a... Um, when you say words of Torah and Torah insights, you get an insight in the, the you, you see the greatness of the author of those Torah insights. However, when we say stories of tzaddikim, then you get in touch with the author of creation. You're able to get in touch with Hashem, who who is the author who made the world. And therefore, the Rishon Rebbe said that's why he showed special interest in this uh, author of stories of tzaddikim, because by saying stories of tzaddikim, you get in touch with the author of creation. So, as such, let's share a story of Tzaddikim. First story is a story of our Rebbe, 
that happened to a young boy named Levi Benish, who was 11 years old, um, living in Crown Heights. And uh, he had a very severe issue. He wasn't able to talk at the age of, as he's growing older, he's a toddler, and he wasn't able to talk, talk at all. Not only could he not talk, but he had this condition called echolalia, if I pronounce that correctly, which means that not only could he not talk, but he could only, if, if, if he responded at all, when someone would speak to him, it would be just to repeat the last word of the person who, of, of what the person said. So they would say, how are you doing today, Levi? He would say, Levi. He wasn't able to, uh, to, uh, to talk. He would just be able to repeat the last word, if anything. So they took him to speech therapists, but didn't get any better. Finally, in 2014, on the 3rd of Tammuz, Tav Shin Ayin Dalet, uh, Levi went with his father to the Oho of the Rebbe, and it was Gimel Tammuz, the 3rd of Tammuz, and they wanted to be by the Rebbe on that day, not after dark, and so they decided they're going to go straight into the Rebbe's OL without the customary note that people usually write before going in. And they were on the line for two hours. And finally, um, and, this, and this young boy, lady, was just playing around, you know, waiting to get to um, their turn to finally be in the OL. So this, the, he goes, finally gets in the OL, his father Davins, and he holds, he holds his son, and they leave the OL. And that night, um, the family got together to have, in a the restaurant, they had a meal together. And while everyone was enjoying the meal, Mrs. Benish asks Levy, so Levy, where did he go today? She didn't expect him to be able to answer anything because he wasn't able to talk. But, and the most she expected him to say was, was be to say the word today, which was the last word of her sentence as he had this echolalia condition. So instead, Levi said, I went to the Rebbe. So his mother said, Levi, what did he do there? He said, I davened. So for the first time, he was able to understand the question and respond. And it was an open miracle that happened immediately after they were by the uh, Rebbe's Ohel. And it continued to progress little by little until Baruch Hashem today, he's able to speak like a regular, regular child. Just in a few, in, in, in the days and weeks after being by the Rebbe, oh, Baruch Hashem, he was able to uh, speak like a regular child. Um, and now for the featured story today, the story I'm going to share with you today is an unbelievable story about words that the Rebbe said many, many years ago that were waiting to be fulfilled, waiting to happen, and were only fulfilled very, very recently, and they're still still happening. Um, it says in the Hayom Yom that the words of the tzaddik uh, last forever. And so, not always do you... Yes, Rosie, what? I should call my hair? What? Okay, I'm being in trouble with Rosie. Rosie, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I'll do whatever you tell me I'm doing wrong and I'll fix it. Okay, fine, I'll stop, I'll stop. Rosie, come here, come come back. Okay. All right, this, this story um, was was shared by the, the, this, the emissary of the Rebbe that this story happened to. And it was printed in the Quark of our magazine. And I'll share with you as... Thank you, Rose. Okay. Um, here's, here's the story. About 20 years ago, uh, Rabbi uh, Schneer Halevi Segal, um, was um, considering where to live in the city of Netanya. He had a few different opportunities, different possibilities, and he wrote down all the different uh, uh, options, and he wrote a letter to the Rebbe, asking the Rebbe where to go. And he wanted to, um, uh, he wanted, his, the basis for his question was, he wanted to live near the yeshiva, where he currently is the head of the yeshiva. 
But the problem was there was no yeshiva yet to speak of. So how is he going to know to move next to a yeshiva which doesn't yet, yet exist? So he wrote to the Rebbe, he opened the Rebbe's letters, and the Rebbe writes in the letter he opened up to by Divine Providence, I heard from Rabbi Rattel, all the Shalom, that the word Igris Kodesh is numerically equivalent to the words Divine Providence. The Rebbe's letters, numerically, the names of the books of the Rebbe's letters, which um, are, equals the words Hashkacha Pratis Divine Providence. Anyways, so the Rebbe writes, you ask about where you should move, which neighborhood, you should move to the neighborhood, the new neighborhood called Dura, and should be in a good and auspicious hour. Okay? So he moved to Dura in this city of Netanya, and it turned out that this this was a really providential decision, as we shall see. So as they were um, in Dura, looking for an appropriate home there, um, they, they walked past many shoals, and this elderly Jew was sitting on a stoop outside a home. He has a a hammer in his hand. He's wearing this uh, French hat, and his his glasses are down his nose, and he is um, and he is um, uh, working on this on putting together this table, and he looks very very interesting, and he says uh, he says to him what. What do you see? This guy's looking at him like, what do you see, man? What do you see? He says, I see the Chabad center in Dura. He had no idea, this Rabbi Segal had no idea what he was saying, why he was saying that, but he just felt, this is the place. And so 20 years ago, in Tammuz, in uh, uh, 2003, um, he became the rabbi of that synagogue. And a year or two after he became the rabbi there, there was a discussion about doing renovations in the synagogue. They got some money together. As it often happens, when people get together to do renovations, the money that they think is, a, is enough to do the renovations wasn't enough. And so what they thought was 50% of the money, it turned out to be maybe 15% of the money. So Rabbi Segel went into the Ohel of the Rebbe, and he told the Rebbe that they need a lot more money to do this, for this, this uh, project. And as he always does, after he goes into the OL, he opens the Rebbe's letters. And the Rebbe says in this letter that he opened up to, This that you write, you only have half the amount. Experience has shown that when you start something, it ends up getting com- becoming completed. And since now is the summertime, and the time for building in Israel... So you should immediately continue building the shul and the mikvah. The shul and the mikvah. He wasn't planning to build a mikvah, but that's the words that I wrote in the letter. So he came back to Israel, he gathered the people in the synagogue together, and he told them that they, they all decided together they're going to finish this project. And as Rebbe said, experience has shown, when you start something, it gets finished, and the, the Huber family... Um, gave the sum that was missing, and Baruch Hashem, they were able to continue. So, as the, on the day that they finished the, doing the renovations, he again gathered the community together, and he said to them, the Rebbe also said to build a, Rosie, you're shaking the camera. The Rebbe said to shake, the Rebbe said to build also a mikvah. So, so immediately, he, they got to work. And they put up, they put a mikvah there in this, in this, uh, in the courtyard of the shul, a beautiful mikvah made according to the highest um, uh, standards of halacha, according to the standards of the Rebbe Hashab, whose anniversary of passing is next, uh, next Shabbos. And they named the mikvah after Rebbe Sinshena, the previous Rebbe's daughter. So what they didn't know, that the Rebbe was involved in the, in this project that they had begun many years before. The um, 65 years ago, there was a a uh, shura, this little booklet was put out for a wedding uh, the, the, between the Vyshetsky and the Oster family. And uh, as very often people do for, for, a, for a celebration of a wedding, they try to put together all the letters of the Rebbe that the family received. And so they put they put together this little booklet, 
And in this booklet, there's a letter to a man named Chaim Axelrod. A letter that has a date of the 15th of Tevis, 1957. Debra writes, in response to your letter, in which you write about the mikvah in the Dura neighborhood. Who is Rabbi Aksarat? What mikvah is Rabbi talking about? What happened with that mikvah? So they went into real, everyone from the Tanya was so interested, what's I referring to? They just found this letter, the Rebbe wants there to be a mikvah there. So they did a, this massive, a um, lot of research, and they discovered the following. This neighborhood was was uh, built in 19, in Tashim Tess, in 1949. And this synagogue, where Rabbi Segal is now, where the mikvah was just now built, uh, was the central synagogue of the neighborhood. And then that synagogue, that area became more of the eastern part of the neighborhood, and all of the development of the neighborhood went more towards the west. So in the area where that synagogue was then, most of the Ashkenazi community was living. So together with the Moatza Datit, with the the Israeli government's uh, Council of On Religion, they started to um, to uh, create the um, uh, build the synagogue, and to uh, they wanted also to build a mikveh in the synagogue, and that this uh, plan was uh, confirmed by the city and by the government in the winter of 1954. On the 12th of Adar Shani, 1950, 1954, at 5 p.m., there was a celebration to build the synagogue and build the mikveh. And there's a letter I have here to the uh, um, from Mr. Bialer, who was then the uh, um, in, in, in the in the working in the government in the religious uh, council in the government, and um, inviting inviting the city dignitaries to attend this um, this this inauguration of the synagogue and the mikvah. But when they finished building the synagogue, they didn't have enough money to build the mikvah. So the synagogue remained without a mikvah for many years. So you could there's there's pictures of the neighborhood from 1958, and you could see that while there was a synagogue that was built then, there is no there was no mikvah in 1958, nothing at all. So although there was officially the, the city plans, didn't end up happening because they didn't have money for it. So in those years, there was a, a this chassid Reb Chaim Axelrod. He was living in an old age home near the synagogue, and he felt the need that there has to be a mikvah there. And he turned to the uh, Rabbi Zaman Halperin, who was then um, the uh, in charge of an organization called the Merkaz Haaretzi Leman Tarat Mishpacha, the Central Israeli Organization for Family Purity. So. Rab Chaim, he turned in a letter to this uh, to Rab Chaim Zalman, asking him to finish the project. Now it's very it's a very selfless thing because Rab Chaim Axelrod he wasn't married at that time; his wife already passed away, and he was living in this old age home. And yet, it really bothered him, and he he didn't get the response he wanted from this organization. So he turned to the Rebbe. He wrote a letter to the Rebbe in 1956 in the summer, and um, he was. Uh, he had one son named Yisrael, who was killed by the Nazis, and uh, when he was only 20 years old. And so his wife had passed away a year before, and yet this was what he was thinking about. So the Rebbe was very involved with this organization for the sake of family purity. And when Rabbi Axelrod wrote to the Rebbe about this, the Rebbe sent a letter to Rabbi Halperin encouraging him to um, to to take care of this issue, and they should build this mikvah in this city, in this neighborhood of Dura. And Eber writes, um, I got a letter from Rabbi Axelrod. And he writes about the building of mikvah, and he said that you he wrote to you, and you didn't respond to him. And he doesn't write about the details, but this is what's going on. So the um, 
the, he, Rehoboam defends himself and he says why it didn't happen. And then uh, he writes, he says how they're very limited funding, and uh, and he had, he had his reasons, whatever it was. And Rabbi Axelrod is not satisfied. He writes again to the Rebbe, and again the Rebbe writes a third letter and a fourth letter to Rabbi Axelrod about the mikvah in Dura, which really wasn't possible at the time. And yet, the Rebbe said to build the mikvah in Dura, and the words of the tzaddik are fulfilled, eventually. And you see, the words of the tzaddik have an impact eternally. So, in these, um, in these letters, here is from Rabbi Halperin about why it's not possible, and uh, he... Um, and Rebbe actually writes Rabbi Aksarad that, that they have a point. Um, but still, Rebbe writes another letter to them that they should still try to do this. So we don't have the letter that the, uh, the Rebbe wrote to this organization. He asked his secretary to prepare a letter. And we don't have that letter yet. Um, we also don't have the other letters of Rebbe Chaim. But bottom line is that in 1959... The um, uh, apparently the mikvah was then put up. So the mikvah was put up then, nineteen fifty nine, and he uh, for whatever reason, nineteen seventy nine, the city. Um, said that mikvah has to be taken down, has to be has to be destroyed. But since the Rebbe's words are always are eternal, so even after the mikvah was destroyed, without Rabbi Segel knowing why and how, the mikvah uh, returned and the mikvah was was built. So, bottom line is, my friends, is that uh, we're in the month of Nissan, the month of miracles, and uh, we should expect to see. The words that are being fulfilled, Nisan Nigalo, Nisan Sinigal, Nisan we were redeemed, Nisan we will be redeemed again. And uh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen any second. Let's get ready. Machayim, Machayim. And have a freilich, good of and all the news.